Welcome to Measures of Center, or more commonly known, Mean, Median, and Mode, the three, the three M's. So we've already looked at um, how to collect data, how to organize it graphically, uh, in in this chapter we're going to look at how to describe data and then later on we're going to jump into inferential statistics and that's really uh, the meat of statistics that's really where the rubber meets the road that's the, the stuff that you would do if you were going to publish something that's the kind of stuff you'll see in journals okay so measures of center is basically just exactly what we've seen mean meaning and mode there are other measures that will kind of go through quickly that aren't used as much but it's basically telling us where the center of our data is as stated here so the first one is the mean which you guys are are already familiar with I guarantee it even if you don't know what the mean is I'm sure you know what an average is and a mean is just the statistical word for an average here are the symbols that you will see in the book describing what you're doing this first symbol is a sigma and that just anytime you see that that always means to sum up a bunch of things so just add up a bunch of things um, the lower case n will always be the number of data values in our sample and the larger uppercase n will always be the number of data values in our population and these symbols will not change uh, throughout the course so uh, the next symbol to just kind of know what it is is X bar so when you hear me say X bar that's the symbol I'm saying that's what you can visualize in your head and X bar is just the mean of our sample right so this is simply telling you to add up add up all of your X's and then you're dividing by how many you have and you go well no duh that's what an average is yes exactly and then uh, this funky symbol here is the Greek letter mu and it's just the uh, equivalent of X bar but for the population so we'll see this a lot in statistics where we have a, a Greek letter for uh, a population parameter and then some sort of just regular old symbol letter combination thing when we're talking about statistics for our samples the advantage of the mean is that uh, it gives us a, a really good overall snapshot of the entire set of data because it takes every single piece of data into account. Um, it's very widely known, people understand it, everybody knows what an average is, but the big disadvantage of the mean is that it is hugely affected by outliers. I shouldn't say hugely, if you, if you have a really large set of data, uh, one or two outliers isn't going to make a really big difference but it can if you have a smaller set or if your outliers really are a long distance from uh, the average if you would imagine you were trying to figure out the um, average cost of a home in your neighborhood and by pure chance you happen to when you sample let's say a hundred houses you grabbed one house uh, that belong to a professional sports player or uh, you know an actor or actress or somebody who made a lot of money and therefore had a 25 million dollar home well now all of a sudden you've got 99 homes that are priced around you know 100,000 to maybe a million and then you've got this one home at 25 million and it's really gonna skew your average and make it seem higher than it should be so they can have an, uh, an effect on your average. Here's a simple example. You guys have all done this before. You add up all the numbers, divide by how many you have, and bingo, bingo, bongo, there's your average. Okay, the median is the next uh, measure of center. Not as widely known as the mean, uh, not as widely used as the mean, and not as um, illustrative as the mean. It really only tells you physically where the exact center of your data is uh, now this symbol here that we have the X tilde is not really a standardized symbol um, you'll see it in some books but not all books so I wouldn't uh, you know get in the habit of thinking that's what the median is always going to be uh, listed as 
the median is much more resistant to um, outliers. If you have one or two large outliers, it will not change your mean much at all, if any, depending on your data. And so it's a really good uh, measure of center to use if your data, in fact, has outliers that you leave in the data. Finding the median um, is pretty easy. Um, just like that big cement divider that runs down the middle of the highway and keeps you from crashing into oncoming traffic while you're texting, the median runs down the middle of your data. So all you have to do is sort your data from smallest to biggest, because it'd be kind of silly to find the middle if it wasn't sorted, because then it could just be any arbitrary number. So you sort it from smallest to biggest, and then you literally find the middle of your data. If you have 10 pieces of data, then it lands right in between the fifth and sixth. Right? If you have 11 pieces of data, it lands right there on the 6th. So if you have an odd number of data pieces, as this example illustrates, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 pieces. So this one being the 4th is the middle, and that is our median. When you have an even number of data pieces, you still put them in order, and because we only have 6 here, the median technically lands right in between those two, and so you average them to get the number halfway in between those two numbers. Now just so you know, there are slightly different formulas for calculating medians um, for larger sets of data, and there's a slightly different way where you kind of weight this mean and you don't actually take the exact middle. So you might get slightly different answers you know, in other sources, but for us, we're going to use this simple approach and just do this. If it's even, it lands in between and we average. If it's odd, it lands on the number, and that's our answer. The mode, as it sounds very similar to most, right? Mode, mode, most, all you got to do is change two letters. The mode is the most frequently occurring data value. Sometimes you'll have a, a set of data with no mode whatsoever, right? Sometimes you'll have two modes, sometimes you'll have multiple modes, sometimes you'll just have one mode. So you could have anywhere from zero to a bunch of modes. Just depends on your data set. Let's look at some examples. So in our first example, one, this one up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? A real simple set of data. Um, what do you think the mode is for that set? Well, hopefully. Uh, you're all screaming at me that, of course, duh, no mode, all right? Because to be the most frequent, you got to show up more than the others, and all of those have frequency of one. Okay, what about set number two? What's the mode of set number two? If you take a look at it, you'll see that set number two has two twos, so it's more frequent than the rest, and its mode is two. All right, what about set three? The answer is not three and a half, because both three and four, you actually write them both three and four, right? So you've got two modes in that one. All right, let's move on to set four. What do you see there? Hopefully you noticed that there were three fives. So even though the four and the two showed up twice, which is more frequent than the one and the three, the five showed up three times. So it's the most frequent, so it's the mode. So take that knowledge and apply it to set five. What do you get for set five? Again, three and four. Okay, and then last but not least, what about set six? Now I know a lot of you are probably guessing that one, two, three, four, and five are all the mode because they all show up twice. But think again about the definition of the mode. It has to be the number that shows up most frequent. If they all show up twice, are any of them more frequent than the others? And the answer is no. So you have no mode that set is really just like the first set where everything showed up once in the first set everything showed up twice in the second set and there is no mode now of course if you came along and just added one more number like six now all of a sudden one two three four and five would all be the mode because they're all more frequent than six okay good job uh, mid-range is Another uh, measure of center, it's kind of a silly measure of center. It's not used a lot because it's hugely influenced by outliers because as you can see from the um, uh, formula, you take the maximum value right, 
add the minimum value to it and then divide by two. Well, if you have outliers, they're going to be your max and or minimum values. So this uh, number can get hugely uh, skewed by outliers. Thus, most people don't use it. I won't use it. We'll be ignoring it. So you can just ignore this. A round off rule. Um, you, this book uh, will uh, tend to tell you to round things to one decimal and I just wanted to point out here that no, I like two. Right, Round to at least two or more. Um, we can put on our, our, our thinking caps and be a little bit more accurate than just one. Critical thinking, we always want to think about our results. We just don't want to be um, you know, stats monkeys that can put numbers into Excel or our calculator and get an answer. We want to think about what it means. So you got to always think, are the example, is the result we're getting reasonable? Um, should we use the mean instead of the median or the median instead of the mean, depending on our data? So those are the types of things you always want to keep an eye out. And then, of course, we're always keeping an eye out for bad data collection and bad samples. Here's an example of that. Why do you think the mean and median would not be meaningful statistics in these two sets? The first one is um, you rank by sales a bunch of selected statistics books. So basically, um, it's kind of like ranking uh, college football teams. Why would the mean and median not work for that set of data? And hopefully you're thinking because well, first of all, it's not ratio level data, right? If we're just ranking, that's just ordinal level data. And uh, means and medians don't make sense with that type of data. Because if you took the average of those numbers, what the heck does that mean? The average ranking? That, that Even if that were a thing, it doesn't tell us anything. And then the second example, the numbers on uh, the jersey of a bunch of, in this case, uh, Saints players. Why would the mean and median kind of be a silly thing to do here? And hopefully you're saying that because these numbers are even worse than ordinal, they're just nominal. 77 is just a name. That's just the player's number. It means nothing. It doesn't mean that player is any better than 76 or 73. So taking means and medians has no meaning unless the numbers we're dealing with are ratio level. So that's the big takeaway here. Okay. Next, we have uh, beyond the basics of the measures of center. It's just some slides uh, talking about other ways to uh, calculate these things. Now, the first one is something we won't be doing because calculating the mean from a frequency distribution, it's no helpful. It's no helpful. Horrible English. It's not any more helpful. It's just another technique of doing the same thing. So why learn how to do something twice? So you can skip this, right? Um, it's like I said, it's rarely used, and it uh, oftentimes can have problems if you're if because you're basically assuming all of your data are the same in each class, and it's just it's silly. We're not doing it. But a weighted mean we can and will do. In fact, you guys figure out weighted means all the time. A good example of a weighted mean is figuring out grades, right? Because each letter is worth. Um, a certain value, but then each class might have uh, a different credit levels. So if you get an A in a three credit class, that doesn't mean as much as an A in a four credit class. So you've been calculating uh, weighted means your whole life without knowing it. So here's an example of uh, someone who uh, got an A in a three credit, an A in a four credit, B in a three credit, C in a three credit, and unfortunately an F, but good thing it was only a one credit class. And now you want to figure out their overall GPA. Well, so we have um, a 4, a 4, a 3, a 2, and a 0 as far as the values of their grades, right? An A is worth 4, etc., etc., etc. But each of those um, data values aren't equal, right? This 4 is not weighted the same as this 0 because this 4 came from a 3 credit class, right? And this one came from a 1 credit class. So we have to weight everything. So here's the formula for weighting it. You take 3 times 4 plus 4 times 4, etc., 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 right? This 3 is the number of credits times the weight, right? The 4. So here's, sorry, it's the weight times the value. So a weight of 3 times they got an A, right? Plus a weight of 4 credits times their A, plus a weight of 3 credits for the B, 3 credits for the C, and 1 credit for the 0. 
And then on the bottom, why are we dividing by these numbers, 3, 4, 3, 3, 1, all added together, i.e., why are we dividing by 14 instead of just, what do we have, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 grades? Why are we not dividing by 5? And that's because we divide by the sum of the weights. Right? The idea of the weight is this uh, A has a weight of appearing three times. So it's almost like we have three A's, and that's why we have three times four. And then this A, having a weight of four credits, means that it showed up four times. So that's why we have four times four. There's the four A's. And then three credits of a B, so we've got three B's, B, 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 right? Three, 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 and so on and so forth. So in essence, we end up having 14 total grades to, um, to divide. And when we do the math, we end up getting a grade point average of 3.07 and that is a weighted mean and the end of measures of center.